Hello and welcome to Pickle TV. I'm your host, Gary Leland. Now, if you found my show on Facebook or YouTube or some other video sharing site, please check out my website at pickle.tv. It's the home of Pickle TV, of course, and the place to find all the videos that I'm going to put up there from the conferences that I attend. And now, if you like the conference, the concept of getting to see these tech conferences on the, on the web for free, then please tell your friends about Pickle TV. Maybe uh, do a post on Facebook, but help me get the word out. Now, in this episode, I'm bringing you another speaker from the Emerging Tech Conference that was held in Dallas in June of 2012. If you're not familiar with this conference, you really should check out their website. It's at etcdallas.com. Now, in this episode, we're going to bring you Giovanni Gallucci. Now, Giovanni developed strategy for online marketing and audience development for forward-thinking clients. Missions, music, media, faith, fashion, film, TV, sports, and causes interested in breaking new ground online. In other words, he's a professional photographer who focuses on, on all those things. Now, he's currently working on Troubadour, Texas, a docu reality TV series airing on the CW network and syndicated nationwide, okay, among other projects, that is. Now, you can find uh, him online at Gallucci, G-A-L-U-C-C-I dot net, and Gallucci's talk is titled Extreme Social Media Marketing, and let's go to Gio's talk now. Let's talk about the big pitch. So, one thing that I bring in, in, in when, I'm, when, when I'm discussing this stuff, this is meant to not only be something directed directly at you guys if you're doing social if you're creating content online but it's also the position that i take with the client number one when i talk about passion with the client and i and i gotta tell you that we're gonna we're gonna push through this in about 45 minutes this was a three-hour presentation when we went up there so i've got a lot of stuff that i pulled out in here and i've kind of condensed a lot of stuff um first and foremost that i talk to about anybody that i'm to and whenever somebody wants to come in and just hire me as a contractor is the concept of passion. Um, because I've been through the cycle, especially doing search engine optimization, where you work jobs because someone's going to hire you and pay you an hourly rate, and you're out there pitching something like dry cleaning or bathroom faucets or, oh my God, insurance. And it is the most, you know, boring, uninspirational stuff you can be out there peddling to the world, right? And so, at some point in time, you're out there, you're on Twitter, and trying to get people excited about homeowners insurance, and guess what? You can't. And so one of the first things we have to recognize whenever we talk about the social space, and this doesn't necessarily mean about blogging, because you create all kinds of informational stuff around concepts that aren't things that fill you with passion. But when I'm talking about creating an audience that you're going to be able to do things that are actionable with, this has got to be subject matter that you are passionate about to be successful. Because when I look across the last 10 years of me doing this, the, the campaigns that I usually take to people to show them how awesome I am at what I do are always campaigns that I absolutely was just completely involved in because I loved everything about what I was doing. Um, the quote I have up there is this guy, Kurt, uh, from Houston, he actually in East Texas, he runs a camp called Camp for All, and he tells the story to people, and he's, he's not a marketer, he's a camp, he, he, he camp leader. And I saw him speak down in Houston at a marketing event, and he starts with this story, and he's got these pictures of this, of this camp, and he just like sucks you in talking about being in the outdoors, and I'm in East Texas in the Piney Woods, and there's like pictures of horses and like boats at a dock and all this kind of stuff and we're all jealous and everything and he's talking about you know we're thinking he's talking about being passionate about what he's doing because he's got a fun job and he's kind of walking through the you know his his uh, you know his his day at the camp and even when he's off what he's doing up there and then he pulls up a slide of one of the campers and this camper is a 12 year old boy who has had his hands burned off his arms he has studs for arms Burns on 80% of his body. And this boy got this way because a year ago his house caught on fire. And his family ran out to the front yard and his little sister was still upstairs by herself. A little baby sister, like one and a half years old. So his dad was going to run around the back to see if, her, what he, if he could get her. The brother ran upstairs through this wall of flames. Grabbed his sister out of her crib. Got a blanket. Covered it in water in the bathroom. Wrapped her up and ran back downstairs. And now he is what he is today because he saved her life. She didn't have a single injury on her. 
And these are the kids that Kirk has at his camp. And of course, the room is like dead silence. You're like, oh, that's not very fun. And his point is, you're right, it's not a fun job. It's heartbreaking seeing these kids show up here every day. But I am unbelievably committed to these kids. And that's why I talk about a passion. Because when you look at the job that I have, it's not fun. It, it, it breaks my heart. But I could not dream of ever doing anything in the world. And nobody knows about Kurt. He's out there at this camp by himself. He doesn't get any accolades. You know, he's not in the news all the time. He's out there being a hero to one kid at a time because he takes a couple weeks out of the summer to show him how to ride a horse, to show him how to, to, to get along in life with these new injuries. Um, and so to the extent that you don't have to be working on a campaign that deals with children that are burn victims, you don't have to be working on a campaign like we're talking about here where we're trying to feed people. But you've got to be passionate. It can be fashion. Oh my God, if you look at YouTube and the top videos that are up there are, are, are teenage girls that talk about fashion and makeup. And these girls are absolutely in love with what they do. So the first thing I would suggest, to the extent that anybody in the room that can do this, and I had a midlife crisis, so that's why I made the switch, right? Um, so some of you are too young to, too young to have had your midlife crisis yet. But to the extent that you can stop what you're doing and either regain a new passion for what you currently do or stop what you're doing completely and change your focus, if you're frustrated about not being successful online and you hate your job, it's not rocket science, okay? Um, and the other thing that I want to do with a client when I sit down with them um, is reset their expectations. Right? Because I don't want people to come in and go, well, we're just going to hire you to create like a YouTube channel and a Facebook account, Twitter account, everything will be fine, right? No, it's hard work. It's a pain in the butt. There's lots of ditch digging, and you're going to see from the way that I lay out a campaign from somebody, there is a lot of complex relationships and deep thought that goes into successful campaigns. So you've got to make sure that the clients understand that when you sit down with them, that this is not going to be a cakewalk. And the other thing that I'm doing here is when I walk in the door and introduce myself to the situation, I'm doing the negative sell because if they start hemming and hawing and start giving me grief, I'm gone. I don't have time to mess with a client that doesn't believe in what we're doing because if they don't believe in what you're doing, you will be guaranteed to fail, period. You need to just leave at that point and then go out and get some coffee. You're in Seattle, for God's sakes. Go enjoy it, right? Um, Okay, so one thing you want to do whenever you sit down, and this is with your boss, this is with your business partners, this is with clients that you're doing this for, this is for anybody, a prospect, is you need to sit down and talk about what you know. And so in our, in our fictional, semi-fictional situation, current state, state of the campaign is they have, this is a 20-year-old campaign they've been doing this for. Uh, they've got a decline in participation. We'll talk about what participation is in a little bit. A decline in revenue. Uh, they peaked, they had a peak year of $9 million in donation one year. Last year they had $5 million in donation. And we have kind of looked at how they run these campaigns and said, you know what's happening is that you guys come at this problem by having one event per year. And in, in this situation we'll call it like the famine action event, right? So one time per year, you go out and you send out a bunch of direct mail and some email because you're really forward thinking. And you send out all these people that kind of hold these events for you once a year. You get all these kids together to do a bunch of stuff. Volleyball and car washes and a sleepover and whatever. And then you leave for 11 months. And then the next year, you turn it back on and everyone's supposed to go all excited again. Well, guess what? 20 years ago, that was fine. That's how we did marketing today. If the kid and if youth are going to be connected with what you're doing, you have got to be communicating with them all the time. There's got to be touch points throughout the entire year because you've got brands that connect with kids all the time and kids get bored with them in six months. You leave and think you're coming back, you're smoking crack. So our biggest issue with what they're doing right now is you're not allowed to leave anymore. And the loss of $4 million in revenue every year should tell you that. Okay, so define some key points. And this, this in and of itself kind of like blows people away because they're like, this is social media. That's the big deal, right? No, there's a lot here. We have to sit down and agree with the prospect. You've got to sit down and, and, and typically what we're doing when we're going through this list, and, and those of y'all that are about to get writer's cramp, I'm going to give this to you. Slow down. 
<laughs> There's like three people going. <laughs> um, all of the things on this list are things that your client or your prospect should be comfortable with because they are standard stuff that you would do in any well-organized marketing campaign. So you want to define your mission. What are the values of the organization, right? What's our objective? Oh my God, how many times have I walked into a customer that's pure frustrated because we started Twitter two years ago and we have no idea why we're doing it? Really? Well, when y'all started Twitter, what was the goal? Huh? We just thought we were supposed to start Twitter and talk to people. No, you idiot, you have to have a goal. Why would you be doing anything in business if you didn't have an expected return at the end? If you don't have an expected return, how do you know what you're supposed to be doing? To find the context that relates to the organization. In this situation, you've got a huge organization running this small campaign. They do all kinds of stuff. So within the overall culture of the organization, where does this guy fit? And they know a lot of this stuff. We don't yet. And so we have to define that. We have to talk about that. Who's the voice of the organization? I am a fat, middle-aged white man from Dallas. I cannot be the voice of your social media campaign when it's focused to 16-year-old kids. So... I'm going to be back there and teach people how to do the basic stuff. I am not the voice. And I like a lot of people on social media get involved in social media because it looks fun. And we get to chat online. You've got to, this is very sexist, man up. And realize when you're not the right resource. It doesn't mean that you can't be a part of the campaign. But there are times when you are not the voice of the campaign. Your job is to shepherd and to mentor and to lead. Where are your existing supporters at? And where are your prospects at? Uh, decide what technologies we could use to reach them. Twitter, Instagram, text messaging, whatever we're going to use. Listen to what's already taking place in the space. This, this organization had Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube set up, and they were kind of on live support. They were nowhere else. So whenever we start to set up new campaigns for them, our job is to sit there and, and have the organization listen to see and understand that people talk differently on Twitter than they do on YouTube, and that generally people on YouTube are horrible, angry people. Um, <laughs> Figure out how you can add value to what they do. Decide with your expected outcomes again. Again, the top one is, is the objective. And then train local group facilitators and leaders in social media. In this situation, one of the key elements here was for us to develop a training program because for this to work, when you want to, when you want to get to the point where you're raising $9 million, and we have a goal at the end that we want to do outreach to over 100,000 organizations, you can't do that with a group of five people in a marketing department in Seattle. You've got to figure out how to do it right and then share that knowledge. So we're building our persona. So now we know that we're kind of going for youth, right? The next part of the exercise here, before we even start anything in social media, is we define who our audience is. And this is an exercise that's twofold. Number one, it's an exercise for the client to understand that we understand their client, right? Their, their prospect. Because they don't want to hire us to do the job. Your boss doesn't want you to let, take, let you take something over and give you access to the customer, which is the, the, the key to the future of the business, right? If you don't really tip show them that you understand who that customer is. The nice thing about this stuff, too, is that we allow the customer to see, or the prospect under this pitch, to see a lot of data that they weren't aware of about their customer. We, and these are people that deal with youth all the time. And half of the information we presented to them was stuff that they had never seen before because they're working off of very old information. And again, their primary resources for getting the word out are direct mail and email. And they think that they're totally hit because they're using the internet. Um, so, so we, so we built some stuff out. We, we, you know, and, and of course there's, you know, we're in a room of about 20 people. And of course the two youngest, hippest women in the room, Pinterest, I love it. Nobody else knows what it is, right? Um, one, one, of, one of the interesting things that I can personally vouch for is that second to the last one. Gen Z is more willing to give up their allowance, buying clothes and going to the movies than giving up their connection or their internet connection or mobile phone. I've got a 13 and a 9 year old, 10 year old daughter now. The apps, that, I, can, I can threaten to brand them and that to them would be better than losing the phone for the day. I mean, if, I, if we, I mean, losing their, their iPhones is, I mean, if you've seen The Incredibles at the end of The Incredibles when Jack-Jack turns in the ball of fire, that's what my daughters do when they lose their phone. And, 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 and to understand the kind of emotional impact that has on a kid, to realize again the power of that, 
When you're communicating to them, number one, number two, understanding that that's where you need to be if you need to get if you're going to get their attention. Um, so some of the uh, kind of cultural and personality things, more socially responsible. Um, most of the tech startups that I'm aware of today, and I would say 70%, deal with doing good for the world. I mean, good is a capital G. You know, how can, you know, I mean, and you've got people who want to be filthy rich and build awesome apps, right? Or build awesome websites, but it's all about empowering other people to do good. Uh, more concerned about the economy than terrorism or wars. Generally feel like the world that they live in is going to stay the same or get worse. So these are kids that are going, but this is kind of weird. We're talking about a generation that their entire lives, or 90% or of their lives, we have been a nation at war, which is bizarre to me. Because when I was born, I kind of grew up through the 70s and the 80s, and for the most part, I never knew war. I mean, I always had the threat of like the, the, the Soviet Union, you know, and, and nuclear war as a child, and that kind of like burned you as a child. But these are kids that have grown up that we have had troops on the, bound, on the ground killing other people for their entire lives. And the news and culture has always been, you know, it, it, it infiltrated by that kind of stuff. So kind of be aware of the fact that they, that everything they know is Columbine and 911 and the war on terrorism, which shapes their 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 buying habits and it shapes the way that they want to go and affect the world and whether or not they're. I mean, surely they're they're concerned about you know things like fashion and music and culture and brands and things like that but they're also very much more aware than than some recent previous generations about uh war and, and the plight of other people and social injustice and stuff like that i mean right now i mean you know what do they listen to besides the fact that you know politics were more divided than ever when it comes to you know conservatives and, and liberals but you've got you know something that's supposed to be amazing like the arab spring and we've had nothing but 10 months of Syria in the streets killing its own people with tanks. I mean, that's what they hear all the time. So from that perspective, you know, we certainly would go in, and what these are, these mood boards, we go in and create these um, primarily to kind of get the client to understand what we feel like this, the, this, this uh, audience is about. So th these are basically posters. We have them printed up in, in Seattle. Before we go into the meeting, we have them kind of set up in, in, in the, uh, around the room and the ceiling. And so uh, we have somebody else on the team who is an expert in, in youth culture that kind of gets up. I sit down and she gets up and she walks through this stuff and kind of talks about, you know, in general, what these brands mean to the kids and kind of how that translates into, buy translates into buying habits and stuff like that. So fr from the perspective of you sitting down and understand, even if you're running your own campaign, these kind of exercises, while I'm a programmer and I'm very kind of like technically minded, these kind of things really, really help me again kind of understand and know who my audience is. And in Leibovitz, uh, the awesome uh, photographer, um, she has a quote that says, whenever I ask somebody if I can take their picture, what I'm really asking is I want to get to know you. I want to be your friend. And she had a basic kind of personal rule that anybody that she was close to, they had to sit down to, for her and, and have her photograph them multiple times. Because that was the way she learned about those people and the way that she felt connected to them. This stuff really, really helps. A um, couple of other things about kind of positioning now. So now we've kind of gone through the social. Again, we haven't even created an account yet, right? I mean, this is kind of crap. I'm not going to use the next ball. We haven't even created an account yet, and, and we've been talking about positioning ourselves and understanding what we're going to do before we get going. It's kind of like learning how to drive before you get your license. Um, the next thing we want to do is we're going to say, okay, now how, we have got to, like any marketing campaign, you've got to have a hook. You've got to have a tagline. And it doesn't mean that I'm going to get up on Twitter, and our tagline is going to be, it's just not fair. But it doesn't mean we're going to get up on Twitter, and every time we tweet something, we're going to go, just went to the bathroom, comma, it's just not fair, www, whatever. You know, we're not going to do that. But this is, again, this, this will kind of bleed through all of our collateral and all of our advertising online and offline. It kind of helps keep us, keep us centered as a team on what we're doing. The reason why we chose this, and again, this isn't, isn't something that the client has accepted. This is us pitching this to them because they've already got a brand that's 20 years old, remember. Well, we're talking about repositioning this in a number of ways. And, and one of the ways that we're trying to talk kind of about repositioning this stuff is their marketing for the last 20 years has been very much driven by, I'm a guy that's 50 years old that's out trying to help feed people, and I think that you ought to know this, kids. And that's what their marketing looks like. I'm going to make you feel bad because I'm Sally Struthers, 
and I'm sitting out here on, on TV eating a sandwich talking about how these kids are starving and I'm scaring you because all these kids are going to be starving, but I'm too stupid to handle my sandwich. You know, that's what their marketing is, right? So we're kind of saying, look, here's the deal. While we have a generation that is very much focused on the world around them, they're also, because of their age, still very self-centered, right? And so the marketing has got to be something that speaks from their heart. And so when we talk about all the stuff about famine and about people, you know, not getting the basic things that you need to survive in life. When I think about my kids, when they really, whether they're really guilty or not, their answer whenever I come down on them is always the same. That's not fair. I mean, that, that is, I mean, a 10-year-old, you know, short of hearing some bad words somewhere about the worst thing she can do to try to push me back and win the argument is for her to stamp her foot and go, that's not fair. Sucks that it never works for her. Because the answer for me is, you're right. It's not. Too bad. So, um, because of that, and everybody else in the room that has kids are like, oh my gosh, you hear that all the time. This is kind of what we settle on. And so, so this is something that has a much deeper meaning. It goes to a child or the youth's understanding of what justice is about. So this is what's going to anchor our campaign. And then lastly, before we get into some of the execution, you know, what is a local group facilitator experience once they sign up for the famine action event? So these are people that can be in um, small groups at a school, youth groups at a church. They can be any kind, kind of a local organization that wants to pitch in and help us with this cause. And these can be secular or they can be faith-based. And, and, and um, mo most of these campaigns typically are run from churches because they're just inherently more organized. Um, you know, what are they going to get? So, so this is a key element when we come into this, to, to this client where we're starting to really kind of make them feel good because we're kind of smart, right? But we also don't want to scare them by coming out and going, direct mail is dead. We're going all on Instagram and everything. You know, not even Twitter. We're not going to do that because it's going to freak them out. They're not going to hire us and we're not going to be successful. So it's really important for them to understand that we, have, we know that these group facilitators have been doing this for 20 years in some cases, and we need to make sure that we have some continuity with what we're doing, and we're making small changes to kind of rebrand this organization, this event. So, you know, we're going to make sure that, you know, we're going to have this event still. We're not throwing out the yearly event, but we're going to have some twists on it. And we're going to make sure that, that when they sign up as a group facilitator, that they're going to get something in the mail. They're also going to be invited online. This, this organization doesn't have a, a place on the web for people to go to donate and stuff like that. This is one of the biggest issues for them, which seem I laugh because it's such stupid. They, <laughs> they have these live events once a year, and these leaders at the events collect checks and cash from kids and then have to send it in to this organization. And we're like, you know, you can take your credit card online. There's this new thing called PayPal. Um, so we're kind of work, we're going to work on something. So we go. So we've gone through all this stuff. And this last line is we challenge that is energized and catalyzed by uh, uh, is catalyzed by Famine Central. So all Famine Central is is basically a WordPress site that pulls all this data in from all these different social media accounts. And one of the things that we wanted to kind of um, show to them. This is going to be hilarious. Is somebody videotaking this? Don't I fall through this? I feel like I'm at the, at the school cafeteria. Um, one of the things we want to do, besides the basic stuff like having the, having Twitter up there, having YouTube feeds, and having Instagram, and Instagram was critical because um, we, we went to everyone at the organization, went to our kids, and kind of said, where is it at? And I knew that my kids' faces were on Instagram 24 hours a day. But everyone at the agency, their kids said the same thing, that Instagram is where, and we're talking about you know 10 to 18-year-old kids. Uh, that, that's super, super important to them. The other thing that we're talking about, and because they have this one event, these events were always kind of self-contained silos. So what we were going to change on this for this Famine Central, and I've taken out their logos and this stuff, was that this was going to become a contest or a challenge now, more than just a singular event where everybody gives their money and you just don't hear about it anymore. The leaderboard up here, we will be able to take funds online from people Kickstarter, something like that, and then track what organizations and what schools are in the lead, and we will have sponsors and partners of this organization that donate funds, that donate prizes, and so the intention being that the person, the school that wins the, or that collects the most money, wins ten thousand dollars cash for the organization. 
The one that comes in second place wins $5,000 cash. So if you're thinking about the fact that how do I get all these other groups that have never participated in, in, in this to, to participate, what about my kids' baseball team? Did they use 5,000 bucks for new bats and, and, and new equipment? What about the school band? Did they use $10,000 to replace drums and, and things like that? So we wanted to, because this group, while they always encourage secular groups to, to be involved, they, they never did anything to kind of reach out to them. So everyone just assumes that this is just a Christian-based organization. And we're saying we need to kind of not deny that because the Bible tells you not to do that. Uh, but we need to make sure that we're inclusive and, and encourage people and incentivize people outside of faith-based organizations to, to be involved too. Um, and I have to point out, because I'm a proud dad, uh, the leaderboard there, the second school up there, Lucas Christian Academy, is my daughter's school. And that's actually the leaderboard. Their school has 179 students. It's one of our biggest things with competition with the people I'm working with was well, what happens if you get this little tiny school that doesn't have very many you know, students in it and they can't compete? And I said, let me tell you a story. So Coles a year and a half ago had a contest where the people that would get, um, get their friends and family to, to give Coles the most likes on Facebook would win a half a million dollars. Our school in little tiny Lucas, Texas have a, has 179 students from kindergarten to 12th grade. That's the entire student body. The top 10 schools won $500,000 each. These kids went out and the school made, made a, a mandate that for three weeks the teachers could not assign homework because all the kids had to be out getting signatures and getting likes. And we would have the kids showing up at the grocery stores with laptops saying, hi, can you help us with the contest? Getting people walk over, log into their Facebook account, like it and log out. We came in second place and won a half a million dollars. And this is a national contest. So from the standpoint of uh, can the little guy do it, all of these other schools, every one of the other ones had over 2,000 kids in their entire student body. We only had we had less than 200. So it can be done. And it goes back to the passion thing. We were bound and determined to get that cash. And nothing was going to stop us. The school got behind it and said no homework for three weeks. And we were out at concerts. We were at FC Dallas games. We were at a base everywhere we could go where there was a crowd. And tell you what, you have a little red-headed eight-year-old girl walk up to you with curly hair asking for a vote, you're going to vote. So we know the power of the children. Okay, so that's kind of eye candy. And clearly this guy here, this is a mock-up. None of that works, right? I mean, that's just done in Photoshop. But certainly the prospect is like, holy cow, because they can now visualize. And I've learned a long time ago, by telling people all the neat stuff you can do, there's nothing like going and giving somebody something to look at. To make them go, boom, okay, that's what you're talking about. That's something we've never done before. And even though we know and they know that it's not going to end up looking like that in the end, when you're especially pitching against somebody else, if you're internal and you're pitching for a budget that may go somewhere else, or if you're an agency and you're trying to pitch for a new prospect, the more of this stuff you bring to the game, the more likely you are to win because it shows that person that you're pitching to that you mean business and that you're going to get it done for them. Sell. So you show them the eye candy, and then our next step is to say, okay, now let's logically go through the reasons why that website, that Famine Central, makes sense for this campaign and how it's going to benefit us. So we go things like connecting the connecting the informational educational content, enabling the participation, encouraging participation, blah blah blah. There's a mobile application element to it. Targeting the, the ideal digital natives, and that, that's basically the same thing as Gen Z. You know, we had to go back through this stuff because a lot of their marketing right now was completely flying past their target audience. Because even my my 13 year daughter, the only reason why she has an email account is so she can sign up to her social media accounts. She doesn't check email. She, I mean, email to her is like an afro and an eight track tape. She could care less about it. If she's going to talk to her friends, even my 10 year old daughter. Because we don't allow her to have uh, a cell phone yet, she's got a, a, an iPod, her friends have figured out now that they can use draw something to text each other. So they'll go on to draw something, and they will draw their message out to their friend, and then they'll go to the next page and they'll write out the answer so the friend didn't have to guess anything, and boom, the message goes immediately. The friend comes back, answers her message, next page, writes out the answer, boom, goes back, and she just sits there all day long, they're texting back and forth. Because we will not let them at 10 years old, she's not getting on messaging. 
There's freaks out there, like assistant coaches for Penn State. So, so um, <laughs> and which he's probably got to draw some. Um, so we got to walk through these different elements, and again, because we had three hours to present, we would kind of sit there and pitch and talk to them about the details of this. I don't need to go through that with y'all, but I just want to kind of encourage y'all to say, hey, you've got to bring the eye candy, but that's not enough. Then you've got to sit down and give people, this is why that, that mock-up makes sense and why it works and how it works for you, right? Um, typically, whenever you're talking to somebody, and, and you're talking about convincing them to use social media, it is always important at some point inside the presentation, and these are good to do like up front, or they're good to do to kind of hit people you know, in the middle, and, and you need to get them to understand what it means to be on these platforms as far as audience goes. The Dallas Morning News has less than 300,000 readers. 300,000 readers in the Dallas Morning News. And from a public relations standpoint, Getting an article about your company, the Dallas Morning News, in the client's perspective is amazing. You go to some of the Dallas Morning News. I'm like, well, I can get you on Facebook. They've got a little bit more people on there, right? Um, the other thing that I always mention about Google, and, and, and specifically Google Plus, is that we haven't talked to the client about search yet, and so this slide would typically come up around the, the discussion about search engine optimization. But any time that Google or Yahoo, to a less extent now, but specifically uh, Google and Microsoft are involved in anything that's social related, photography, video, text-based, anything, you participate, period. Whenever you guys leave here, go and do a test and go and take something off your website that doesn't rank yet in the Google search engine. Go and post a link to it to Google Plus. And within six or eight minutes, do a search for that again and it will show up in, 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 in the Google search engine. And go and do the same thing on Facebook and check it a week later and see if it's there yet. So from the standpoint of like having an overall vision, because we're talking about while social is kind of the point of this discussion, you can't sell social by itself. You've got to be considering search. You've got to talk about email marketing. Email marketing is still pound for pound the best spin that you can do online. Uh, you've got to talk about it these guys direct mail because it's, a, it, it's an organization that is built upon direct mailings. However, and they know this, they're terrified of it, their, their donors and their supporters are literally dying off. Uh, their average recipient of a direct mail piece is over 50 years old now. And they are waking up and going, what's this internet thing? You know, because they just, you know, just were, were intimidated by it and never got on the bandwagon. So typically we'll, 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 we'll kind of go through and say, okay, here are, the, here are the things that we're kind of concerned about, the sphere and the social space. This is where traffic comes from. The reason why you, know, you don't hear too much about Google Plus in the press, but we're still going to be on it is because of this. And you start kind of peppering the conversation with, you know, now that we've talked about who your, your customer is and the fact that we understand it, now let's talk about where we're going to be online in order to engage with them. Then we go into search. I'm not going to go through this slide. You guys have seen, anyone who's seen me talk have kind of seen me go through this 15 minutes of like the basics of search. But you do need to kind of sit down and, and at least give the client a kind of a high level of how a search engine works and, and the fact that while you are talking about content and you're talking about passion, right? And, and, and we're talking about anything that you would learn from copy blogger, from being a good, if you suck at writing, don't write. I suck at writing. That's why I do photography and film. And, and you have to acknowledge what your weaknesses are, what your strengths are. So understanding how the search engines work and, and, and how not just communicating and engaging with people, but creating content that feeds those algorithms is critical because that's gonna add to your budget. It's gonna add to your effort to be able to do that well. And if you're doing all this stuff and ignoring the search engines, guess how your client's gonna check on whether or not you're doing well? They're gonna search for themselves on Google which means you're not going to have the contractor, you're not going to have the budget very long because you're not going to show up. And they give some basic examples of, of what that looks like, you know, you know performance-wise in the search engine called site, talk to them about how we find the right keywords, talk to them about how you integrate the keywords into their, in, into their content, um, talk a little bit about trends with them, because again, now that we've level set with who, the, who the, the customer is and who our target is, we now need to kind of level set with, you know, Social networkings have a 43% increase in time spent on them from last year. Email marketing has got a 30% decrease. So while there's a lot of people still using email marketing, it's still important. 
Um, we need to make sure that we need to be trained towards be, uh, being online more and being in that space uh, than the other. Um, show more graphs, more stats. They love stats. Seriously, the reason why you do this stuff is because I can be up here and I can tell you all the stuff that I know that's kind of from my gut, but whenever you're trying to explain this stuff to somebody else, it's critical that you use third-party objective information to back up what you're saying so that they can trust the fact that, hey, I think you need to be able to run Instagram more. Well, is it just because Geo likes Instagram or is there some data to prove that? You need to go and find Nelson or, or find Comscore or someone else that has done some research. And in some situations, you may find that you're just simply wrong. And the worst thing you can do is go up and pitch something to somebody and then have someone come in behind you and tell people that you're wrong and prove it. So make sure you're verifying what you're telling that customer. It's not bad to figure out that you're wrong. That's a good thing. It may be sad, but it's not bad. Um, so make sure you're using third-party stuff, and then boom, this is what we're going to use, right? And so you kind of say, okay, now for you know, four-year campaign, we start actually doing strategy, and I hate, I hate, hate, hate giving strategy to clients. And the, so to the extent that I can do enough, and the reason why I do this is because they haven't hired me yet, right? I mean, all of you guys, you hate going away and giving away the milk without them buying the cow. You know, but at some point, you've got to tell them enough so that they trust that you know that you can get it done, but you need to leave some of the secret stuff out in the process. So not a big deal to go in and say, okay, based upon what your needs are, these are the platforms that I'm going to be focused on. You know, either Drupal or WordPress. Uh, we definitely want to use RSS, and then here's the social networks we're going to use. Um, some of these are going to be just kind of tertiary sites that we're just kind of tossing content on. Other ones we're going to be heavily engaged in. And then you talk about, you know, some details. You kind of go through, listen, again, when, when I've got three hours, I can spend 20 minutes kind of going through every single social media site and explaining how it benefits and how it makes sense for their organization. So for this pitch last week, the ones we pulled out were Facebook, Flickr, Foursquare, Google+, Plus, Instagram, Kickstarter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, text messaging, stumble upon Tumblr, Twitter, and YouTube. That sounds like a lot. It's really not. There are hundreds of social media sites out there. And then we talk about, in the very beginning, we talked about goals and objectives. Then we talk about how we're going to measure. Now, we know that these guys, because they're not terribly forward-thinking, don't have Omniture installed. Uh, they do have Google Analytics. They don't have any kind of dashboards in place. And because we're just introducing them to the concept of, like, really integrating social media into what they're doing, I'm not going to come at them and try to get them to write a check for Omniture because they're going to laugh me out of the building. So in their situation, I've got to come to them with almost free tools that will get the job done, that will kind of like, it's like the gateway drug to analytics. When they start seeing some of this stuff, what I'm hoping is that they're going to start missing some details and data, and they're going to go, well, how can I get this? Oh, well, let's step up to mutual line. Well, how can I get this? Well, that's going to require Omniture. How much is Omniture? Then it's their decision. It's not you being the bad person expecting a ton of cash because you're already providing them with a dashboard in, in analytics. It's them making a decision about what platform they need to select to get the data they want. And, and it's also helpful because organizations tend to kind of like get into this, like, the, this data trance where they spend all their time looking at numbers and forget about talking to people on the internet. Happens all the time. And then we give them a wow. We need to go and, and do something in social media, demonstrate actually executing something in this small thing. We, we presented all this data to them about their customer, about where we're going to be, and then we want to come and we want to show them this is something that we've done that is completely different from anything else you've seen, or you're going to see, right? And if you've seen me talk, you guys have seen me do this many times when I talk about using EXIF data in, in, in photography and how that can get up in the search rankings. So I'll kind of go through my shtick and I'll say, okay, Flickr, the reason why we're using Flickr is not because I want people to look at pictures of starving kids. The reason why we're using Flickr is because it feeds the search engines. And then I say, okay, on a basic level, you know, those of you guys that have iPhoto, you can go and add, add, add data to your pictures, blah, blah, blah. But for those of us who have things like Photoshop and Aperture, there's all this other text-based data that can be added to your, your photography. Boom, when we deploy the stuff to the internet, it's not that we're shoving all that text in front of the user. The user just sees a description, right? And so I go through the technical reasons why this stuff is important to a search engine. And I talk about the terms of service on websites, which you can and can't do. You don't want to get your, your sites uh, deleted and stuff like that. And then the big coup de gras is, what does this get you? Well, you search for social media expert, and boom, out of 13 million results, I'm number one because I do this with pictures. 
Now, one caveat is that I'm no longer number one because I've pulled that website offline. However, one thing that's neat is that in order to kind of test this theory to see if this works, the new website that I am focusing on for Social Media Expert, which I started about a week and a half ago, is currently number 10 on Google. So for me to take a domain that literally is less than 45 days old and be on the home page in that amount of time for a search phrase because I'm optimizing content from Google and mo or from Flickr and most of that content is being directed by 301 redirect is pretty amazing. Pretty amazing, I'm awesome. Um, okay, so, so, so we've gone through all that stuff and the client's head spinning. Oh my God, there's too much information. Then I've got to kind of slow down and say, okay, let's talk about the stuff that you guys know. Your group facilitators. This could be youth leaders, they can be teachers, they can be band leaders, whoever. Um, let's talk about what they see from us whenever we they go and sign up for the account. Now, stuff that, that, that our client is comfortable with, email. So I'm getting them comfortable again. They're real anxious right now because I got into all this crazy stuff about photography and flicker. I come back and say, okay, let's talk about the email plan. And we talk about the intro the, the intro letter that someone gets whenever they sign up. And then we talk about a little bit of a direct mail piece. So, you know, in, in this box, and then we have stuff mocked up. So within that four-day time period, I had a creative agency go in and pull together what this welcome box would look like that got delivered to them through UPS or FedEx. And so we, you know, we, and we came with us like some temporary tattoos and stickers and some things that would be inside that box. A printed out letter that you see over there of what it would look like. And we talked to the client about, you know, for us to kind of re-envision this campaign for you, we're going to do something you guys have been doing for 20 years and everyone here loves it. And you've got staff that's supposed to be punching holes in paper to fit them in the binder so they won't be fired. Um, so let's kind of go through this stuff. And we walk through that stuff and everyone's feeling comfortable again. And then we come back with, again, email. And we say, okay, so they've got the first email. They've gotten the box in the mail, direct mail. Then we're going to hit them up with a second email piece. And this is where we go and take what they're used to doing. This is my boy. I just felt Peter Herman. Um, you know, this, is, this right here is the piece where we merge all this stuff together. Because now we say, okay, we've gotten the email marketing out, and we've talked to you about social media. When we found out on a Thursday about having to go to Seattle on Wednesday about doing this stuff, the first thing we thought was, how do we integrate video into the piece? And so Friday, we went downtown to Dallas, and we did some man-on-the-street interviews, and I took that footage, and over Father's Day weekend, I took that footage and built this video. And one of the interesting things about this video, probably what you should, should wait to tell you afterwards, but one of the interesting things about these videos is that we took a little bit of a humorous approach initially about the subject, which is something that, that was blasphemous within this organization because we're talking about famine. But what we wanted to do thinking about the audience is, can we do something to kind of let people chill out a little bit first and then hit them with the, with, with, with the hard stuff? So first of all, they've never sent out an email with any, even like social media buttons on the email, much less an embedded video. And when the video is done, I talk to them about how the video is actually embedded from YouTube and analytics and blah, blah, blah. And I'll show you what this piece looks like. And again, this piece was shot and edited over a 48 hour time period. challenge for those involved in your ministry. Probably most leaders in the church know that world hunger is an issue, but I wonder about others. So we asked a few people some interesting questions about food, and some more questions that are a little more serious. Uh, have you ever played the game Hungry Hungry Hippo? What is the grossest food you've ever eaten? China, and uh, so I don't really know exactly what I've had, but I'm assuming I've had some dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See how we're going to move the easy. 
to go out for two weeks at a time and actually be the voice. We talked earlier about how the fat middle-aged guy can't be the voice of the youth. We'll go get the youth and get them to be the voice for us. And not only that, we will have them on the ground doing it from the place that we're trying to help. And, and so these, these kids will obviously also participate. So as you see, what we're doing is we're taking all of these concepts that they've been doing for 20 years because a lot of this is A, you never want to come in and stop doing what's been working. And even though they've been losing funding, five million bucks is nothing to sneeze at, right? So we don't want to go in and take that stuff away. We need to add to it and do things that help them grow into the future from a technology standpoint. And then after the event, what are we doing? You know, because this is the key element. We've been doing stuff leading up to the event. When the event is over, how do we stay connected? Will we keep those social media accounts going with those kids that have the boots on the ground? The, the, the contest I mentioned earlier about the prizes, the contest awards get, get awarded about a month and a half after the event, so we keep people invested in what's going on for another you know, 45, 60 days. Then we start immediately pitching for who's going to participate next year. And so what happens now is we turn around and, 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 and we turn the cycle back on and we see now we're moving towards the next event. And then we start the email campaigns, doing the social media stuff and all that kind of stuff. Um, talk about what we're trying to do with changing the attitudes of, of, of the people that are participating. So how do we create, while we've got youth that are focused on doing things for the world, how do we drive a youth-driven worldview that says you've got to help people that can't help themselves? And we talk about some of those details. Another video to wrap it up that, that, that's there. And then we go back and you say, now you want to go back over your big points. So at this point in time, if, if, if the person that you're sitting in front of that doesn't have buy-in, you're, you're kind of done. But if they do, you want to go back and reiterate the main points that you were trying to make during the presentation. And then they give you a check, which is the best part of the presentation, and then you start working. So um, I did that in 55 minutes, I'm surprised. So, so that is mind-numbing, and usually my talks are because I go through so much information in such a short amount of time. But that kind of should give you guys an idea of um, how you can get people in your organization, or if you're an agency and you're selling this stuff, it's really critical, at least from my experience, that you learn how to integrate things that your prospect is comfortable with today. Show them how that, that, that social media can be additive, and that you're not coming in trying to like rip out the foundation and start from scratch. Because we in social media think that's the best path to take, right? Stop what you're doing and do all the cool stuff. No one has, that's writing a check think that that's a good idea because their way, the way that they're writing that check is the old stuff you want to get rid of. So that's one of the key elements for us in the space we need to understand is make sure that we start working slowly towards uh, a solution to these people using the stuff that they're comfortable with. So with that, I'm going to put up. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed Gio's talk. You know, Gio is the guy that I always go to every time I see him and ask him about 20 questions. Now, make sure and come back next week for another video from the Emerging Tech Conference. Now, if you like what I'm doing here, I'd ask you to consider dildomains.com the next time you buy a domain name, website, hosting, or anything like that. Dildomains.com is my GoDaddy reseller account, plain and simple. So if you use GoDaddy or you like GoDaddy, please consider and use Dildomains.com instead. In other words, buy your GoDaddy stuff through my reseller account. Let me make a dollar off you every time you buy a domain name. That's it for today. So until next week, this is your host, Gary Leland, saying goodbye, and thanks for watching.